Hello chess friends, this is International Master Valerio Levov speaking and today I'm going to touch on a very delicate subject that I haven't been uh, talking since year 2013 and in, that's because there has been no reason for me to do so. Essentially, I, was, I'm t I refer to the topic of chess cheating and essentially what type of measures and what type of occurrences have happened uh, during the years so essentially all the organizations try to prevent that and essentially how different players have actually attempted to use cheating in order to profit whether it's going to be about getting rating points and, and winning tournaments or just basically getting certain money now very recently there have been some really disturbing development that many players don't know about and that's been mostly locally so I'd like to give a short briefing on what has happened since year 2013 and what's going on right now and what I believe should be done so that essentially the cheaters could be reduced to minimum now since 2013 and the notorious uh, uh, yeah, Borsov and Ivanov's case of cheating what has happened is that the World Chess Federation feed has taken some very good rules and measures to prevent people possibly from cheating. One of the most important of those rules was the actual idea of uh, uh, allowing strip searches, which is very important. Now, besides uh, not letting a player to have a mobile phone, there is a possibility for uh, inspection a sudden inspection upon the player's request of course by an official uh, doctor and so so this has been really good and that has really put the cheaters to minimum I mean, I mean what happened with Ivanov is that uh, he there was there was a very big tournament that was organized in his hometown so he started winning all the games and then he was playing he was he was paired to play against a very well-known grandmaster Maxim Glugi and what happened is he was requested to take off his shoes right before the game but he refused to do so upon his refusal essentially he was expelled from the tournament and the further on he was banned by the uh, Bulgarian Chess Federation for 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 uh, declining to show up on the cheating test to prove that he can actually play at the level he's been so he didn't show it there he refused to to be checked or inspected during a game so essentially he was banned now after that case there were some uh, not so known less famous followers that tried following some of his appro approach like there was a hometown a uh, uh, hometown friend of his that that he basically attempted to do uh, to do something similar in Spain he was ch asked for an inspection and he refused it and so basically that led to his expulsion uh, expel uh, again so there have been other cases like that during the years but nobody really pulled off anything because thanks to those new field rules that allowed the uh, uh, officials to check people uh, so everybody could really make sure it's a fair game, it's a fair play. However, those people who want to use cheating in chess didn't give up. I mean, there have been a very, there's been a very notorious case of a grandmaster that was basically stripped of his GM title because of having a phone in the bathroom. I mean, that sounds like a really simple thing, but it basically he was caught in the act. There was the chess position on his phone, and he was essentially expelled not just from the tournament, but his GM title was stripped off, and he was uh, banned for three years for doing so. And there have been, of course, other so-called witch hunt type of uh, you know cases that were basically unfair certain players who've been striking with very strong like four out of four five out of five in tournaments I mean not not having the rating or the level for that have been accused that they they probably cheat to get to that of course uh, I'd say that you know the truth always wins so those players who've been playing fair were easily discovered that they were actually playing on their own and probably they were lucky or they were just very well prepared for that tournament however what happened recently even with those really good 
anti-cheating measures is that there is, at least in my opinion, a significant weakness which allows the wittier, the smarter cheaters to use the drawbacks in these rules in order to achieve maximum result. I have a particular case to talk to you about, so bear with me until I say what I think the problems are. The problems of the sudden inspection as well as the, uh, the strip searches is that a person does not need to have a device on him in order to cheat. What I'm saying is that there are other ways, you know, like as similarly to what, the, what a grandmaster did in order to have his title stripped off very recently is to have a device somewhere else, somewhere near, or probably a helper who could be around him and basically make certain uh, like help through either through gestures or maybe not so much gesture, just providing device. You see, there are, there are so many little devices, there are so many ways to try and trick, because again, you can ha actually ask for a strip search, but okay this is not an airport there is no scanner seeing everything and everyone you know in a, in in each in each area so essentially there is always a way to sneak in or maybe to sneak out a device or a helper that could provide the necessary help now let me talk about someone who's been winning for a long time for the last couple years and have been recently brought to my attention because of of the unique pattern on how he's cheating I'm going to point out a few things right now up front so that there is no confusion. I do not want to accuse anyone without specific proofs. However, as similar as it happened with the Borislav Ivanov's case, many people just stepped on to, on my toes and they said, you don't have a proof that he's cheating, all that you do are guesses, but later on, it was proved that he cheats. They found even some wires when he actually refused to be uh, to be checked. Uh, at least that's what that's what the, the the strong players say. Now, I don't need to have proofs to give my speculation on what I think is happening in that case. But here is, in my opinion, the modern method of a chess cheater, so that anybody who knows that essentially could figure out ways to prevent it. So, first off. What Ivanov did very stupidly on his own is to use the top chess engine. Now, if you look at any rating list of engines, what you will find is that the top chess engine is with a rating of 3,358. Now, that is more than 500 points above the world chess champion, the current world chess champion. So, essentially, you could see that in order for someone to play at the level of a world chess champion he can take up and use any engine any engine within the first probably the first two or three hundreds or so on not to mention that some of the weakest chess engines that have been like since ten years ago are playing still at a top grandmaster level so what we can expect is that we will have a smart cheater who is basically using an old engine to play at a GM level. Now that makes it more difficult to detect in compare, comparing it to the engines who, which are top in the list. Because those old engines obviously do not play at that level. They do not provide the same moves that a top engine would do. For example, if you set an engine of, say, early 2000s, playing at a rating level of 2600, we can easily see how someone by using such an engine will easily get the points and the rating by simply following that old engine suggestions and making sure he's undetected. But okay, let's talk about something more concrete. How would a person do so? Now obviously, there doesn't need to be a concrete evidence. Circumstantial evidence also helps to say that someone is a cheater. Seeing that he makes 5 out of 5 in a tournament, or 6 out of 6, or 7 out of 7, defeating all the other grandmasters out of nowhere, essentially makes it for a pretty good case against a cheater. Then there's all the tests, all the checkings, and everybody knows, okay, this guy is doing something wrong. Because, you see, there is a pattern. Nobody, out of nowhere, can just defeat grandmasters who've been actually working and uh, studying for 20 years or more. So I would like to make it pretty clear that even though there are some geniuses like Michael Tal and Bobby Fischer, nobody, none of them, did achieve 
a world champion or a grandmaster level in one way. So it makes sense for a smart cheater to do this gradually. Taking up his game from, a, a, let's say, a rating of 1900 that he's been supporting for a few years and then just winning slowly and basically uh, manipulating his results to earn rating in steps is the most natural way to do so. It doesn't raise suspicion. It almost seems like he's actually improving his play and nobody is going to set a doubt. Okay, this guy is just like he's a newcomer and he's defeating all these grandmasters. So it makes a lot of sense to expect that someone who does things gradually will succeed in doing so. And of course, the third thing, don't jump. Like the idea is that some people will jump, they will just beat 26 or 26, 700 grandmasters and that immediately raises the suspicion how is he doing so? How, like for example Ivanov did some incredible games versus uh, top GMs and so immediately people said this is impossible. It's impossible someone who doesn't actually have the level or the rating or the understanding of the game to play like this. So there are other ways to gain rating. For example, if you go to a tournament, you can lose to one or two of these grandmasters. By, by winning the other players, 22, 2100, or 2300, you can very easily make the rating slowly. You get 30, 40 points each tournament, and then easily you can get into the right level You know, in a more of a gradual, and we could call it a human type of approach. You see, these are all small, planned things that m are made so that one doesn't raise suspicion when he's actually cheating. It's important to understand that because, you see, the concrete measures allow us to do just one thing, suspect, like, circumstan circumstantial evidence versus somebody, depending on his fast results or the, uh, you know, irrational way of playing. And more importantly, the checking process, being able to check and inspect someone directly before a game or during a game. But that's not enough. As I mentioned, the circumstantial evidence is not enough simply because people can avoid it. If they plan their career as cheaters, especially, I mean, as, as strong players that actually use cheating to help their, or like weak players that use cheating to help their results, you could very easily see that the circumstantial evidence of just winning GMs in one, in one minute, they, that wouldn't happen. They will avoid it by making it in the smart way, slowly, gradually progressing to a grandmaster and a title and winning all these big tournaments as a result. Okay, but how is a person going to avoid the, the, the checking process? Now, once again, I would like to outline the huge flaw of inspection. The inspection could happen during a game if somebody notices the problem with the way uh, with with the game, or perhaps before a game. But if a cheater is smart enough to figure out a way on how someone can help him, or a device that's near him, and eventually he could he could access during the game, it's going to make it almost impossible to detect. Now, there are other sophisticated methods to do it, but let me present you with a case now because I suppose you're wondering who are you talking about? Who is that guy which is, who is doing so? Now, in order to avoid all the hater comments, I do not want to mention specifically this guy is an absolute cheater. I may believe it myself deep down, but I will leave it up to you guys to decide what you think and what you make of the way and the patterns this guy is applying in his own tournaments. Now let's see for example this guy. And the ratings are pretty good. 2300, 22 and 2100. He's 20 years old. But I'd like to bring a few points up and then I'd like to share some suspicions. Now if we look at the rating chart something pretty easy to see is that like going directly at to see his rating. His rating has been steadily improving which is awesome. A lot of people have steadily been improving. There's 1800, there's 1900, there's 2000, there's 2100, 2200, 2300, and he's now going with a 2400. The problem is a lot of grandmasters have actually complained to me saying this, there's something wrong about this guy's play. He's just playing too perfect. And I was like, okay, well, there's no problem with that. What is the problem? He's just playing good chess, right? I mean, he's improving, he's studying, he's working on his game. Yes, but they say, you look and you see the way he's playing. He's playing super fast, super easy. He's destroying masters. And then very next second, 
he's playing against someone else, usually like some I mean, some other guy, and he's basically taking his time, and he's losing the game very badly. Like, there is no pattern of strength there. On the contrary, we see a possibility for someone to play perfect chess, more or less. And then suddenly, on the very next game, not on another tournament, on the very next game, he plays like an idiot, or like just terribly, so to speak. Like, you know, I sometimes play like an idiot, but I don't do it at the same tournament. I don't do it like that. So, winning and purposefully losing games will make people ask the question, why? Why would somebody win games and then lose games? And then drew games. I mean, that sounds like a pretty reasonable human chess player, right? No. If you've planned your results very carefully, now you can decide which games to win, which games to lose, and which games to draw. And is there a way to program an engine to do so? Well, if you want to lose, you just don't lose an engine. If you want to draw, and that's actually a very important point that I want to make, Similar to Ivanov's games, something I noticed about this player's games is that when he makes a draw, he makes it in a very simple, one and the same way. I'm going to show you. He basically exchanges pieces. Now, that may sound very simplistic to people who are not professionals or strong chess players, but essentially there are many ways to draw the game. Drawing with just traits and traits and traits shows just one pattern. Whatever the engine is, it's being set or programmed or modified to exchange pieces and go for the draw no matter what. That's the easy way and how you can get a draw in a game where you basically dominate. The engine can win at any point, but it doesn't want to because it's programmed to go for a draw. So that's how you manipulate draws. If you want to lose, you lose the game you want to lose. And those games that you could win that are actually against relatively weaker opponents or master just not that high rated to raise a suspicion, you do it in the right way. Now, okay, what about proof? Now, again, this is just speculation. I want to tell you this suspicion is being actually confirmed by many of the strong players and friends of mine, not only. I've asked many people and they've said the same thing. There is no pattern of strength. When you play strong, you play strong always. If you actually play weak, then it makes it very it makes it very apparent when you play like a weak player and suddenly the very next game you start playing like a top GM and you destroy someone in two or three moves. So let's talk about some specific examples. Now in all my previous reports about Ivanov, I used to start an engine. Now, I'm not going to do so because something very important I'd like you to understand is I believe this guy is not using a current engine. So his moves, even though some of them may match the first or the second line of a current engine like Komodo or some of the big ones, it will probably not match many of the moves that will match, let's say, an engine from 10 years ago that is still playing at a 2600 strength. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to show you certain patterns from human perspective so you can understand. Not the quality of the play, Patterns. I call them the inhuman patterns. So watch out carefully. This is a game that was played by the same guy who has 2300 right now and an international master. Now the game starts out pretty well. I'd I would not like to comment specifically on the theory or anything. I just want you to see the flawless strategy that basically contains no, literally no, suspicions, no moves that are inconsistent. Every single move is just an absolute perfection in every way. White develops quickly, he has a center control, he continues being active with moves like knight takes d and bishop f3. And with the upcoming moves he makes some really unique ideas like queen going to c1 and then just bringing up the pieces in very powerful harmony this is an incredibly strong play. The rooks are good, the queen is beautiful, the bishops are awesome. Like every single one of these moves. Now you would say a master would do this. Perhaps. Perhaps this may happen in a master's game. But there's just so much. Like for example, imagine the move of h4. Like it's a good looking move. Let's weaken the king side. 
But then there's suddenly it's followed by you know some very different type of ideas like rook d2. If I was white, I would have probably thought about bringing the bishop here to follow up with an attack on king's side. Now that's no proof that rook d2 is bad. Surely, I mean, setting up the two rooks makes sense, and it's the best move. You know, even if if you start looking at it like in five or six engines, it will tell you genuinely that this is best. Now keep in mind that all these moves, from what I've been told, were played extremely fast. That this guy does not spend any time thinking. Now think about that. Whatever you do in chess or life, you need time to think, to check, to consider possibilities, and choose the most optimal one. When you do something fast, there is only one possibility to consider that fast is good. It's the machine type. When you set a machine, it makes things really fast and really good. There is no way how this can happen in any other sport, except if it's not like just about time. See, when it comes to chess, when it comes to studying, when it comes to, you know, just being good at something, painting, let's say, you need time. When you don't need time is when a machine helps. So anyway, let's keep going. We have a really strong rook sequence, and then there is the knight coming down. A beautiful combination that takes away the black, back, uh, the black good bishop. And then, you know, white just keeps on pressing. There is an exchange, another trade, taking the pawn on b7. And black is literally destroyed. I mean, you see, black didn't make any of the apparent mistakes, and yet he just lost a pawn. There's been the black king that's now completely outside. The knight is down. And, I mean, now there's the, per the absolute perfection of not letting black to make any counterplay. So, it was really great. Like, making a sequence, giving away the bishop to take that knight, then coming back. And then essentially, you know, it all can, you know, really leads to, to a winning queen's endgame. And it's brilliant. Now, I want you to remember this perfect play and compare it to the next game that was played a couple of days ago when this guy was going to meet one of the best grandmasters in the country. Now, essentially, defeating such a grandmaster will raise suspicion. So I want you to check on how the game goes. It goes awfully terrible. Not because he makes some small mistakes, because of huge Ds. Take a look. There is a normal opening. H4 seems like a fine way. But then there is plenty of mistakes, huge ones. For example, while everything looks pretty normal of, of, of here, and as of this moment there is no suspicion that basically there is a uh, an advantage or not, everything looks good. Suddenly, some really irrational moves start. Like, for example, the idea of playing g4. Now, I have to tell you, no strong player goes flawless. Everybody makes a mistake. But what's important is that you will find in the master games, you will find imbalances. Like, somebody makes a little bit of a mistake. Somebody makes a little, gives a little bit of a chance to the opponent, similar to what g4 does right now. It basically weakens the JH4 pawn, and the whole structure of white gets completely busted. It's not even a complicated combination. Sure, white wanted to take that pawn back on the, D, on the D6, and it kind of feels normal. But if you look at the next few moves, you realize that this is just being completely uh, like non nonsense, because then there is a trade of queens, and then, okay, another trade happens, which is just basically awful. I mean, as a, as a good player, I'll tell you, I'll never, con I'll never consider taking that queen. I mean, this just gives black an ability to have a pass pawn and the knight. Now, you may say, okay, but white was probably having a bad calculation. What, what's the big deal? Well, I suppose. Or maybe he was just playing himself this time. And making all these inaccuracies and bad moves was just because he wanted to play himself. And naturally, that leads to a loss. Now, Black didn't experience any difficulty in winning this game. This was just an easy win from a master's point of perspective. Some bad, some terrible sequences that were, I would say, rated for... I mean, a white, white strength in this game was around, at most, 2000 to 2050. And yet, Black was a grandmaster, so he really didn't have any problem in realizing the endgame. So, one of the things I would like to mention is a key pattern the human and the computer playing. There is no big way to prove who is a human and who is a computer unless you see it through the master's eyes. Now, there have been some incredible results by young and not so young players. 
that that are amazing but in all of their games you're going to see I call it the human play the planning the inaccuracies that happen the fact that the opponent didn't spot these inaccuracies the inhuman pattern as I call it is the absolute perfection from start to finish and the fact that most of these moves do match with an engine now which engine is that there are hundreds of engines you see, if you try to compare it to the engine of, oh, this engine just, you know, it, does, it gives it only 70%, or this engine gives only 50%, it, you cannot do it, because he can start any of those engines that are rated above 2400. I mean, if you start Fritz 5, you're probably going to get a Grandmaster level out of that. And Fritz 5 was like, what, 20 years ago? So you see how many engines have actually appeared since then that are better in rating. I mean, the current Fritz 15 is over 3,000. Fritz 5 is probably 2,500. So anybody who's using Fritz 5 or even Fritz 3 or Fritz 4 is probably going to get to an IM level. So comparing it to an engine doesn't work. You have to look and compare it to could a human play so perfectly all the time and then the next game just completely throw away everything. Now, I'd like to show you one more example. Now, this was played in the same championship in the final Bulgarian Man Championship between this guy and another master and I want you to see how easy this guy takes on the master it's really simple what this guy does is a perfect development of his pieces like that the way that's the way it goes and from then on follows a long sequence of flawless moves could a human find him probably but if you look at the at the next game or one of the next games, you will realize that's not happening. It's like a different person is playing this game and the other game. That's what I call the inhuman pattern. There is a pattern. Like, for example, let's imagine that we have a painter, a world-famous painter. He paints one thing. And then, right after that, I mean, on the very next day, he paints another thing without any change of conditions. Okay? So he paints something terrible. Hard to believe, right? Okay, so on the very next day after that, he paints something beautiful again. Brilliant. And then again on the one day after, he paints something horrible. Now, certainly you can find some physical explanation about that. But how likely it is that you will see something like that happening in any good or great painter's uh, uh, life, lifetime? It doesn't happen. They have maybe good periods or bad periods. Bad tournament in which you can make bad moves you perform badly. Good tournament in which you perform good, but it's not like bad game, good game, bad game, good game, and in the end it always ends up good. He always gets the extra points to his rating. It always ends good in the end. Now that is what I call sometimes manipulated tournament. You manipulate the results. Which game you win, which game you lose, which game you draw. That is important. Now, for example, take a look at this. After the exchange takes and then b4, black had to move his queen. Now white followed up with a very strong challenge. He castled, he pushed up in the middle, taking there with the bishop, and then of course after a good sequence he just basically has everything. The long diagonal of the bishop, the space, and then white is slowly and flawlessly outplaying his opponent. There is not even one bad move. There is not even one small mistake. There isn't even one small chance for the opponent to fight. Now, tell me yourself, have you ever been in a game in which you don't have even one small chance? You see your opponent is destroying you so powerfully. And yet, you see that guy next game being completely smashed because he plays terrible. And the next game after, well, I think you get the point. There is something wrong in all this. Now, I don't know what's wrong. I will judge, I will let you judge that. But take a look. This was great. Now, black white created the weakness. He moved the queen up to b5. He made an exchange, went on with a check. And then black resigned because after the rook straight and the queen comes out. And then he just forces a check and then black loses the rook. It was a 20, 20 or so short game how a master, almost 23 or 2400, was destroyed. And I want you to check this other game.
of the same guy. Now this time he was black and he was playing against one of our best grandmasters, top GMs too. So just check this out and see the difference. We talk about a flawless game in the previous one and we talk about something that an even 1800 wouldn't do. So black plays normally the opening. Okay, the opening is good. It's the bishop is coming out. The castling is coming out. And then suddenly there is, okay, a few moves, just normal. And then there comes a move that's pretty horrendous. I mean, okay, some will say Bobby Fischer used to play the knight against Spassky, and then this, this is a move that just opens up, but not in this position. There is no activity coming up here. There is nothing that justifies the doubling of the pawns, and especially what comes the moment white pushes black pieces down. There is totally no compensation, and anybody will apparently see that. With all the pieces on the back side and no attacking coming up, it just loses. Like... Basically, this is completely horrible. Like the knight, the, the 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 bishop is being challenged, the pawn is being attacked, the king is around there, and it's just, it's an easy game. I mean, okay, I would understand from an amateur's point of view, you'd say, okay, but Valerie, I don't see so much difference. I don't see what you see. Like, how do you show that this is like a such a horrible game? It looks like a fine game, and the other one also looks like a fine game. But you see, it's just it's different between a fine game and a bad game. And there is a significant difference between a perfect game and a horrible game. And all these coming like in plan. So he like he planned to lose against these to two top grandmasters. He planned to win the other people and he did. Okay? So this is not normal. Now I'm gonna show you something else. I mean obviously this game was over before it even begins. I mean White's play was easy and, and simple and winning. But I like to point out something very interesting. I'm going to bring up a few games of the same player making draws. Now check the pattern. It's one and the same thing. Exchanging pieces. It's like an engine is programmed to trade off pieces and go for a draw. Believe me, if a certain player tries to make a draw or wants to make a draw, he's not going to do it through simple exchanges of the pieces every game. It's impossible to deliver the course towards that point. But imagine that you're playing against a little kid, for example, or a very weak player. You can very easily direct the game. Similar way, an engine will direct the game towards exchanges because he knows how to do it and do it safely. Check this game. Our guy was playing with white. It was played yeah, last year. So similar to that, we have an exchange. We have here. Then there is another trade that's happening very soon. The pawn is taken back. And actually what you see is that there is another trade coming up in a couple news. Trade, trade, trade. Until in the end of the day, after a few more trades, the game ended up in a draw. Okay, so it makes something. Now, take a look at this other draw. It's the same pattern. We have a different opening, different sort of you know sequences, but it's the same thing. Trade, trade, trade. Like this guy wants to draw and he, the engine or whatever is there, whatever magic's there, I like to say magic, but you know what I mean, basically goes in one and the same pattern. Now something interesting is that in the games of Ivanov, Borislav Ivanov, many, many, many guys defended him back at the time, back in the old days, before he gets caught. There was the very same pattern. He was not losing games though. That was his mistake. He was not purposefully losing. He was winning and drawing a few. He was drawing weak players and winning the strong ones, which made no sense at all. And that's why uh, there, was, there was so much circumstantial evidence against him. This guy makes it smart. He draws certain people, he loses the strongest, and he beats some of the weaker guys, earning L rating points. And especially, now you may wonder why someone will do that. Someone will do that for, for a number of reasons. Rating gain gradual improvement as well as winning the section. If you win a section you get a prize almost as good as the first prize in the open. You see? So just keep that in mind. Not everybody likes to beat grandmasters to, or to profit from that. So what you see is the same pattern. Exchange, exchange, exchange and a draw. Let me show you a third one. That's another draw. Now you see draws happen because of perpetual because people agree to it but there is no draw of that kind. What we we have is another game, another opening, another sequences, and another exchanges. I mean, come on! Every single game that goes for a draw is in one very specific program way. Now, tell me it's not strange. Now, I don't know how you see that, but considering the idea 
of having someone who was rated 1900. I mean, I played this guy. I played him a, a few years ago, when be before that streak happens, right before that streak happens, I played very casually and I beat him with no problem. He was, what, 15 years old at the time? He was really easy for me. I mean, I saw no great talent. I saw no big possibilities. He was just a guy who was very nice, by the way. I, I have no bad impressions from him. I, I like the guy. But then suddenly, on the very next tournament, there was this strike and there's this reoccurring pattern. Like, winning every game he wants, losing the game he wants to lose against usually specific people, and drawing through exchanges. I mean, come on, guys. Exchanges? Every draw is an exchange? And in one and the same pattern? Tell me you don't think what I think. In any way, I don't want to speculate anymore. I, would, I look forward to seeing what you guys have to tell about that. And I look forward to seeing how the events develop. Because from what I learned, he was actually checked in some of the tournaments he played. But he was checked during the game, during a specific game. Now, we don't know if he was actually wearing anything on that game or whether he was he wanted to win it or not <laughs> but basically we don't know that also we don't know if he is cheating in the same way as Ivanov is doing it I mean Ivanov was actually using a very simple way he had something in his shoes and his friend has had something in his chest that was later discovered okay this was discovered so for all of those of you who thought okay he was innocent he wasn't it was proven he got expelled he got banned because it was proven. Later on, eventually, it was proven. Now, obviously, a smart person, a sophisticated cheater, will improve, will optimize that way. He will do it smart, he'll make sure he doesn't get caught, and he's going to try to use the holes in the system to use the drawbacks of this just checking one-time check method. Now, one thing I can tell you for sure, if one is innocent, it will definitely come out. But when there is so much that basically suggests manipulation, the games, the results, the way of playing, the inconsistencies, I believe something else is at hand. So I give you guys the opportunity to think about it, and I do hope to see uh, like some more development on this. I hope you stay tuned. I'm going to bring up some new videos when there is more on the topic. And I thank you once again for watching me. I'll see you next time.